OK， 呃，大家好，我们继续讨论什么是政治理论的问题。嗯、um, ，我先用英文做呃总结上次讨论的问题，然后继续讨论。然后我们讨论最后几分钟，你们要想一想，你们同意你你们觉得哪方哪种方法论是最有说服力，好吗？所以你们要听得很清楚，因为我会讲。几个方法论，但是你不一定都同意。你们觉得最有说服力？你们觉得是哪个？好吗 ？OK， so let me、uh, continue. Let me.、Uh, the issue here is what is political theory? Why study it? And what are the proper methods of studying political theory? So, the first, let us look at the thoughts of two famous philosophers on this topic. One is Aristotle, the ancient Greek thinker that we all know, who famously said that what makes humans distinctive is the capacity for speech. Right? We're different than animals. I mean, some animals can say a few words, maybe, like monkeys, but no other animal, if we call ourselves animals, has the capacity for very elaborate. And imaginative and creative speech, and what makes this speech distinctive is that we have the capacity to distinguish between good and bad, to make normative judgments. Say, for example, this is a good political society. This is a bad political society. Animals do not have that capacity, so it is because we have. The capacity for speech, as well as the capacity to make moral judgments and to distinguish between good and bad, that's what makes us distinctive, and that's what makes political theory so important. No other animal can do political theory. We can do it. And Aristotle thinks that all citizens of a political community have the capacity. For speech and to make moral and political judgments, that's why it's important to think about these topics. Okay. And now let us look at Kongzi. It is a famous saying, a famous dialogue, the longest passage in the Analects of Confucius. It is Confucius asks four of his students. What is your political ideal? And the first three answer in ways that are more conventional when we think of politics. I need one student says I need a big army.、Um, another student says I want to have a lot of military force and so on.、Um, but what is very interesting is that the last student, Cheng Xi. He has a very different view, right? He says, "Well, to me, the ideal、uh, is just being in a kind of、uh, beautiful scenery,、uh, swimming and singing with my friends." And then Kongzi, Confucius says, "Wow, that I think you have、um, you make a lot of sense."、Um, but then, why does that make a lot of sense? Well, here is a very interesting and innovative view, right? Politics is not just about what happens in government or at the level of the state. We have to have good and harmonious relations in everyday life, with friends, with 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 family, with strangers that we encounter. If we have happy and harmonious relations with them. Then it's much easier to have a harmonious and stable political community. What happens at the level of everyday life has huge implications for what happens in government and at the level of the state. This is Kongzi's insight here. Okay. Now, what exactly is political theory, right? Well, for one thing, obviously it involves a discussion about 
the nature and, and purpose of politics. Okay? And what really makes political theory most distinctive is that it involves a normative component. In, if you take other courses in political science, what you learn is about how politics works. You want to understand and explain politics. In political theory, what we do is we want to evaluate politics. We want to think about what is good politics and what is bad politics. We make judgments. Remember Aristotle's view. This is what makes us distinctive as, as a kind of animal is our capacity to use language to make judgments, to distinguish between what is good and what is bad. And this really is what is distinctive about political theory. We spend our time arguing about what is good and what is bad. And we give reasons for what we do. Right? Well, for one thing, um, you can argue that other fields also make judgments about what is good and what is bad. For example, science fiction, right? Also, if you read science fiction books, they also have imaginative scenarios about good and bad societies. But that's different than political theory. Political theory, we try to be empirical. We try to ground what we say in judgments about how the world actually works. We can imagine a society where AI, Ren Gung Jernang, are smarter than us, and then what kind of political community that would involve. But for the moment, that is not a realistic possibility. We can imagine a world where we can fly from here to, uh, to Denmark in just by using our arms and be there in one hour. I mean, that is science fiction, but it's not empirical. It's not consistent with our sense of how the real world actually works. So on the one hand, political theory is normative, right? On the other hand, it is also realistic. Or, for example, it's different than theology. Shen Xue. In theology, you make certain assumptions. For example, God exists or God is good. And then we just take those assumptions and we don't argue about them. It's a matter of faith. In political theory, nothing is a matter of faith. We argue about everything, okay? This is what makes political theory distinctive. It is systematic. Shitong, shitong da, shitong da. What does that mean? It means that we always have to give reasons for our views. You can't say, oh, what do you think? That's it. You have to give reasons. Shamalio, what are the reasons for your views? And try to respond to people who have other views. Try to persuade them, okay? This, it's always an argument. We're always arguing, which means giving reasons for what we do and responding to actual or potential counter arguments, okay? This is what makes political theory distinctive. Now, journalism is very interesting and very useful. You have many stories and reporting on things that happen, but it's not systematic always, right? It's not necessarily well argued and in depth. So when you write papers for this course, you have to have a good argument. You have to give reasons for your views and respond to counter arguments, okay? And political theory is historical. 
Why do we study the great thinkers of the past? Because they have put forward great ideas that influenced history, right? That influenced the way that people thought at the time and sometimes later. For example, Kongzi arguably didn't have that much influence in his own day, but he had a huge influence, you know, 500 years later, all the way till today. We have to understand what the great thinkers said, why they said it, and the influence it had in history. Only then can we make well-informed views, right? Now, it's different than social science. Usually, you focus on a problem. Like, for example, how to resolve the bad traffic problem in Jinan. That is a question that you can address using numbers, maybe, big data, and maybe consulting with citizens. And it doesn't really matter about the whole history of traffic problems, you know, in ancient Greece or in ancient China. That's not relevant, right? Um, you just focus on the problem and the historical context and background is not necessarily relevant or even interesting, right? And some people do fen shi zhe shui, analytical philosophy. They take very abstract questions like what is equality or what is freedom and they try to answer those questions in a very abstract way without understanding or engaging with what the great thinkers have said in the past. That is an approach that some people engage in, but it's not political theory in this sense. So why do we have to understand history and traditional values? Because it helps us to explain sometimes why we have certain views, the origin of those views, why those views are stable over time, and why when you try to do different things, those things are likely to fail, right? For example, why did the Cultural Revolution fail? Wen ge, you know, wei shema, shi Well, one important reason is that it tried to completely destroy Confucian values that people cared about, like family values, like respecting our parents, xiao, filial piety. You can do it, maybe, for a short period, but if it really goes against people's fundamental traditional values, it is not likely to succeed for the long term, right? Um, as well as tradition can inspire many social and political changes. As you know, there is a large revival of Confucian values, of Buddhist values, of Taoist values now in China. Because people think that those values can help us think about how to progress, how to lead a moral life in the future. So history and tradition has great value and we have to understand it well, okay? Also, political theory is comparative. What does that mean? It means that we now we know that we live in a world where different cultures and societies and civilizations have different histories, different political theories, and different outlooks on the world that maybe we could learn from. When I was a student in Montreal at McGill University in the 1980s, I studied political theory only learning the Western political theorists, starting from Plato, and Aristotle, 
all the way to John Rawls. And we didn't even know, it seems, that there was great thinkers outside of the West. I hadn't even heard of Kongzi or Mengzi um, or great thinkers from India like Kautilya. It was an assumption that political theory, we used to say, is Plato to NATO, uh, meaning that only the Western political theorists count as great thinkers. Of course, now we know it's a crazy view. We have to learn from China, from India, from the Islamic world, from all the other great cultures that have provided thinkers and insights from the past. The same goes for China, right? Before the 19th century, there was also the view, we can call it a Sinocentric approach, Zhongguo, Zhongxinglun. And there was an assumption that only China has a great civilization. The rest of the people are kind of inferior and we don't really have anything to learn from them. That view is equally crazy, right? Now we are in arguably the best time ever for the study of political theory because we could learn from all the different cultures and civilizations we have access to their works through the internet, through libraries, and often through translations. It's great time where we could still be grounded in our own tradition and culture, but learn from others. And by comparing with others, we also understand ourselves better. It's only when I started learning about Chinese philosophy that I could really think about what is distinctive about typical mainstream Western values and how they are prioritized in a different way. What really matters is, I mean, many cultures have similar values, but they are often prioritized differently. Why in the West do they put civil and political rights above social and economic rights? I mean, it's, it's an interesting question that only comes up, or only, only when you compare with, with cultures that do things differently, like China, does it become a kind of something you have to think about. So, by comparing, we learn about others as well, okay? And we can learn, and we could learn ourselves better. Understand ourselves better. Okay, why study political theory? Well, one approach is we just want to pursue truth. The most famous text in Western political theory is Plato's Republic, Li Xiangguo, which is an account of philosophical truth. And the view is, once we understand what truth is, then we can govern society in a better way. That is the argument in the Republic. Contemporary political theorists like Leo Strauss have a similar view that the first and main task of political theory is to understand and pursue truth, okay? But other political theorists have a different view. For them, it's more about understanding history. A very famous Western political theorist uh, in the United Kingdom, Quentin Skinner, says that what we really have to do is understand history. Look at why thinkers in, say, Italy, 400 years ago, why did they say what they did? Look at their arguments in the historical context, and then we can understand what they were doing. In Chinese, it's similar to si xiang shi, the study of intellectual history. And it's kind of separate from the question of truth. Who's right and who's wrong 
is not necessarily the key issue here is we want to understand why people said what they did, what sorts of challenges they were facing in their day that made them say what they did, who their opponents were, who they were arguing against, and why, okay? Today we have many people in China who do this kind of work. A very famous thinker is at Tsinghua University called Professor Chen Lai, and he engages also in very detailed historical work looking at what ancient Confucian thinkers said in different periods and why they said it. But other political theorists have a different view. For them, and again, these views are not necessarily in conflict. For Plato, on the one hand, it is the pursuit of truth. On the other hand, he also wants to train and educate a political elite. 当然,孔子是一样的,问题是怎么培养君子,对不对? How to cultivate and educate a minority of people who have superior ability and virtue. This idea, in Chinese sometimes we call it 贤能政治, is hugely influenced throughout most of Chinese history, and still now, here at Shandong University, Part of what we do is peyang ren cai, We try to educate, uh, well, a minority of people, we can call them an elite, who can govern better, who can care more about ordinary people, you know, who wei ren ming fu, that is what we try to do, but it's a minority of people who can do that. Both the typical Confucians and Plato have this view. But other political theorists say the main focus should not be on educating an elite. It should be on educating ordinary citizens, gongming or laobai xing. They're the ones who are really important and so much democratic theory, which arguably started from Aristotle to a certain extent, has been over this issue. How can we educate ordinary people? Lao Bai Xing. They're the ones who have a huge influence and we have to focus on them more than an elite. So, in most of Chinese history, it has been this view. How to educate a minority of, to, who have, of people who have superior ability, um, and, and virtue, and in most of Western theory, especially the last few hundred years, it's been about how to have more, how to educate ordinary citizens, okay? But there's another group of theorists. These all have different views, um, but they say something different. Well, again, remember for Kongzi, it's not just about educating an elite. He also said, you have to look at ordinary life, including family life, including relations between friends. That has to be informed by values like harmony, he, or compassion, ren. Um, and once those relations work well, then the other political, more political relations also are likely to work well. You have other thinkers, a French thinker called Michel Foucault from the 20th century, who argued that power is not just about what happens in the state. It's also what happens in schools. There's a power relation between the teacher and the student, right? There's a power relation in hospitals between doctor and patient. Of course, there's a power relation in prisons between those who are guards and those who are prisoners. We have to understand and expose those power relations, he argues. That's a very important political task too. And then we have feminist Nu Xing Zhuizhe who very famously said that the personal is the political meaning 
what liberal theorists have traditionally called the private sphere of life, like family relations, is not just private because what happens in the family has huge implications for politics. If I'm in a family and my wife does all the housework, does all the caring for the children, I do nothing at home, no caring for the children, and I'm applying for a job in business or in politics, who will get the job? Me, because the assumption is that I can fully devote myself to the job because my wife will do the family work. So, if you have inequality in the family, it will also lead to inequality outside of the family. And if we care about equality outside the family, if we care about giving equal rights to men and women in school, in politics, in business, then we also need equality within the family. Why does Shanghai have arguably the most equal relations between men and women in everyday, in society, in business, in everyday life? Well, the main reason is simple. Because in the family, men in Shanghai do more of the housework. And therefore, women are more free to develop outside the family context in an equal way, right? So these are all important issues. Now, how do we study political theory? Well, here, there's no it depends on what the aims of political theory is, right? If the main purpose is the pursuit of truth, like in Plato's Republic, then you can write things in a very abstract, very difficult way if that's the best way to access truth. That's fine, right? If you read Plato, it's not always that easy to read because his main aim is to tell us what philosophical truths are, which requires a lot of argumentation and responding to different views. And it need not relate directly to the real world. If I have an ideal society, like in Plato's Republic, and it's, there's a large gap between our, how we live our life now, it doesn't matter. I mean, maybe in the future it'll have influence. It, it doesn't matter in some fundamental sense whether it has influence now. If the purpose of political theory is historical understanding, then it's different. We have to have a very detailed historical investigation of who said what, right? If you look at, for example, debates in the Song Dynasty, you know, involving Zhu Xi and some of his students, you have to have very detailed understanding of the history. And that is, your, that is what you try to do. It's a micro-analysis of who said what to whom. That's what really matters more than the pursuit of abstract truth. If the aim is to train and educate a political elite, 如果目标是培养精英, well, then what we do is different. Maybe it can be difficult, right? If you want to be a, a public official in China, at higher levels of government, it requires a lot of training, right? A lot of knowledge of how the economy works, a lot of knowledge of history. We learn from history what worked and what didn't. A lot of experience in small communities, in large communities, in poor parts of China, 
in rich parts of China, it can be difficult. And we also want to look at what some of the great thinkers have said about this in the past. But it can't be purely abstract. It has to be empirical. If you want to be a leader in China, you have to have a good understanding of how China works, right? It's obvious, right? And you have to be concerned with effectiveness. You have to know what works and what doesn't, or at least do your best to focus on what works. It's different than if you pursue truth in a very abstract way. You have to think about what works and what doesn't in China now, in the real world. But if your main concern is to educate citizens, then it's different. We don't have to look at so much what great thinkers have said in the past. We just have to understand what it means to be uh, to fulfill your duties as a citizen. You know, if you engage with people here in Aoshan Wei, how do you engage with them in a civil way? You know, for example, issues like Li Rang. You know, these are issues of ordinary citizens and that, Im that are important for educating and improving ordinary citizens. This is the most important task of political theory. And it involves participation with students, much more so. I have to engage with you so that, so that we can learn from each other. And it's not just an elite lecturing to the rest of people. If the purpose is to improve everyday life, well, again, you have to look at different things. If it's, for example, inspired by Michel Foucault's view that power exists in organizations like schools and hospitals and prisons, then we have to understand how those prisons and hospitals and schools work. We would visit, um, maybe, prisons and hospitals. We would try to understand how power works in this university and whether we think it's justified or not. Um, we use more examples of everyday life, how ordinary rituals work. When we invite people here in Shandong province, why is there a hierarchy with a person sitting here and the main guest sitting there? It, you have to investigate those issues and think about to what extent they are justified or not. And we also look at how ordinary rituals can change us by singing together. Why do we sing together? Why? Well, one reason is that it generates a sense of community and harmony. And you have to listen to others and, 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 and change what you do in response to how others sing, right? These issues are very important for Confucian thinkers who say that we have to focus on everyday life in order if we want to have a harmonious society as a whole. So finally, um, how to measure success? How do we know that we're doing it right? Or at least that we're doing it okay and that we're not failing. What standard can we use? Well, as a teacher, the one thing is ask you to write papers and then I grade you your papers, right? If you get a high grade, it means you succeeded. But ultimately, it's more than that, right? You have to think about why we have better political theory and worse political theory. Why are some people going, doing good work and others less so? Well, again, it depends on the aim of the political theory. You know, if the aim is the pursuit of the truth, then we know we have succeeded when we get closer to the truth. Okay? I mean, it sounds a bit abstract, 
because it's in most of Chinese political theory, that's not how things are put. But at least if you think of Plato or many thinkers in the Western tradition, we are doing good work when we have better truth. Okay? Um, whether it actually leads to improvements today is, at the end of the day, not that relevant, so long as I have access to the truth. I mean, put, of course it had influence on religion too, right? For the Christians, once I have faith in God, I know what's true. And then that's almost sufficient. Of course, it should influence everyday life, but that's not the main test. The main test is whether I have, the main test of success is whether I have faith in God and not so much whether it leads to actual improvements in today's society. If the aim is better understanding of history, well, then we have the test of success is whether we have done a good job of understanding the historical context for debates, right? Why is Quentin Skinner a great political theorist? Because he provided very accurate and persuasive understanding of what, well, of what Renaissance Italian thinkers said about politics. Why is Chen Lai a great political theorist? Because he provides a very accurate and detailed understanding of what ancient Confucian thinkers said and why they said it and what was the historical context for the debates. Whether it influences our lives today, whether it's true or not, is not that important at the end of the day. If your pursuit, if your aim of politics is to train a political elite, then obviously the test of success is we have done a good job of training a minority of people who have superior ability and virtue, xian neng zheng zhi, with the capacity to improve society, to care for the welfare of ordinary people. If they have succeeded in wei ren ming fu, with ability and with in an effective way, then we have succeeded in our task, okay? The democratic approach would say something different. We have to look at ordinary people, look at citizens. If they are better informed about politics and more able to participate in politics in an informed way, then we have succeeded. So, it's a different test of success. Finally, if the main aim of understanding uh, of, of political theory is to look at everyday social and political theory, uh, everyday social and political relations between people, then we have succeeded in different ways. For Michel Foucault, who looks at power relations in organizations and institutions below the level of the state, typically, then we have succeeded if we have exposed power relations in schools or prisons or hospitals. Um, for Confucian thinkers, it's more if we have succeeded in promoting harmonious relations in the family, among friends, among ordinary people. If we have a more harmonious local community, so to speak, where people act with each other with compassion and kindness, then we have succeeded because it's quite certain that it will be easier to govern that kind of society than a society where the relations among ordinary people, among family, among friends, among local community people is poisonous, disharmonious, and violent. Okay? 
Um, so for feminists too, if we have succeeded, once we have equalized relations with the family, then we are likely to have equal relations outside the family. That's the test of success, okay?